Supply chain security is possibly the single biggest threat facing American traders. This is CTPAT, which is the Customs Trade Partnership Against Terrorism. It's one of the um, uh, interagency task force uh, groups that's been created to make sure that in a world where we are so stretched in terms of where we sell and how we consume and where we consume, and the myriad lines and nodes that through which products and services flow, as does information, the chances of creating a disruption in one part can create a serious security concern in, in the other. So why is, is supply chain risk such an important thing? Supply chains are inherently complex. They're dynamic, so they're complex mainly because you've got multiple different moving parts across multiple different countries, through more, multiple different transit areas, they're dynamic, which means that things change all the time. A small um, strike somewhere could create, could wreak havoc on another place. Uh, um, a flood or you know, suddenly an earthquake could change things dramatically. Because it's dynamic, it's also fluid. Because things, as things change, you cannot stop the supply chain. Instead, you have to constantly keep on um, resetting the puzzle and reconfiguring the pieces in order for it for things to still run properly. It's characterized by uncertainty, ambiguity, and friction. Uncertainty because you really don't know what is going to happen. So this is uncertainty is the unknowable of unknowables. So it's the unknown of unknowns. If it's a risk, you can hedge. If it's uncertainty, there really isn't a mechanism to hedge. Ambiguity is doubt. So you start worrying about what could go wrong. What would it cost us? How would it impact us? What happens if there's a component that goes, um, that, that fails? How do you manage these? Friction is when you're no longer being able to smoothly operate something, but you never know. The very fact that something could be stuck at a port, which is on strike, whether it's in Belgium or in Dubai, really doesn't matter. But the very fact that something could be stuck at a port and you suddenly might have to go and bribe somebody, go through 50 different customs, um, hoops and so forth, suddenly creates friction. Now these characteristics cloud the operating environment, they create risks. The risk assessment part goes through many different bits, but the primary piece of the puzzle have been sort of in the news for a very long time. There are always issues about terrorism, whether you're talking about terrorism in open seas, such as um, uh, the Horn of Africa, where you've got the Somali pirates and Safeho uh, taking over um, uh, or trying to attack ships and hold people ransom, like the story of Maersk, if you've ever watched the movie Captain Philip. Uh, you've got port security. Given the fact that there are over 12 million containers annually coming to the United States and 200 million traveling worldwide, you really don't know when something stops at a port, exactly what happens. Uh, are they putting something in? Are they taking something out? Are, is there pilferage? Are they adding certain bits that could later on become a potential threat? Port security. You've got 300 different US ports and oftentimes ports are not very well managed and not made very secure. Then of course you've got things like longshoremen strike and longshoremen strike have, you know, longshoremen are people whose main job is to load and unload cargo of ships. Strikes by longshoremen suddenly hold these uh, vessels and their cargo captive because they really can't do much without um, worrying about uh, the perishability of the goods and goods and produces and safe health. And then potential airport attack, you've got um, 
things like um, Los Angeles, La Cordia, Malpensum, you've had it in um, the Brussels airport, you've had threats in Heathrow. These suddenly create a series of delays. The very fact that an airport is um, evacuated or stops functioning basically means hundreds and thousands of FedEx and Amazon and other cargo bits that are supposed to flow from one place to another. They're all delayed in the process. So what are supply chain hazards? Firstly, you've got theft or pilferage. You've got competition and because of competition, the very fact that your product or a component that makes up your product could be delayed could suddenly spin you out of the market altogether. Information systems, you can have technology, but if the technology fails, everything goes all right. If you think of um, about um, what, uh, the very last week of May or first week of June 2017, uh, British Airways had a massive IT system failure because of which um, everything went into a standstill. You've got cell phones and cell phones themselves end up being supply chain hazards because to a certain degree these relay messages and information travel very fast plus of course you've got um, issues related to whether there are certain hazards in carrying cell phones themselves. You've got um, different thumb drives, you've got camera phones, you've got disgruntled employees, you've got lack of training. So there are different supply chain hazards in the process. So why should you care about supply chain security? Is it an American problem? No, the answer is no, it is a global problem. Um, a single delay at, a Heath at Heathrow Airport can suddenly delay the entire Super Bowl weekend because so much stuff comes in through these large ports all around the world and airports that what we think of is a very American activity like uh, Super Bowl is actually carrying hundreds and thousands of pieces and components and um, um, music instruments and sporting equipment from all over the world. And a small issue at, a, at Heathrow Airport can suddenly delay the Super Bowl weekend as it happened in 2005. We've talked about RFID. Now RFID is radio frequency identifiers and these are nothing but small chips that can be embedded into things so that you can track them and make sure that they are transparent, that the supply chain itself is transparent. There are ISO guidelines for supply chain security and ISO is international standard organization that make sure that um, you've got to follow certain tenets in order for you to um, ensure supply chain security. And then of course you've got terrorism insurance a long time ago, uh, possibly a couple of hundred years ago too, a very famous British company called Lloyd's of London was, became famous mainly because it would ensure all these ships that were making perilous voyages all over the world, whether they were trying to build colonies or were merchant vessels that were carrying uh, spices and goods over um, long distances, over multiple months, sometimes even years. And they used to insure those. Today you've got terrorism insurance where you're basically buying insurance to hedge against terrorist attacks. So, if you are to think of um, what was the cost of 9-11, an event a terrorist event that impacted the supply chain. So Fortune magazine mentions that it costs about 50 to 80 billion dollars every year in the process. Um, you've got inefficient supply chains, your transportation cost goes up, goes up your inventory increases. Whenever you've got uncertainty in a supply chain, the first thing you start doing is you increase your safety stock and increase your 
economic order quantity because you need to hold more so you try to hoard more and more so that you don't have issues about such as stockouts. So when asked of different executives, this is what um, the, the question that was asked was, which category of risk poses the most potential threat to your organization? And what is highest is supply failure, more than strategic risk or natural dis disaster or geopolitical events or regulatory risk or logistics failure or IP, which is intellectual property infringement. So supply failure. So the key out here is that we depend so much on suppliers and suppliers are global. They're all over the world. They're in many different countries and many different regions shipping through myriad different lines. These are called different modes. And if you're shipping using multiple different types of modes, such as uh, trains and um, trucks, so planes, trains and automobiles, it's called multimodal. It's called multimodal. So combine the fact that you've got many different suppliers all across the world, shipping in different ways, in different pieces, across multiple modes, the chances of failure increases because complexity increases in the process. So supplier failure is one of the most important bits of risk. So you've got other bits, including terrorism and piracy. Obsolescence. Obsolescence is the is reduced shelf life where your product becomes obsolete over time. Pilferage is stealing. Information breach where you're now suddenly realizing that you've got sensitive information if that itself is stolen. You really can't help it. You've got proprietary data in camera phones and thumb drives. You've got cyberspace security if somebody could hack into a system. You've got RFID data security. It's interesting to know that about 66% of sea lift containers arrive at 20 major ports. More than 58% of all inbound containers come through New York, New Jersey, Los Angeles and Long Beach. And these are the places where things can go wrong, whether it's a strike or whether it's terrorism or whether it's just serious lack of training and daft employees. It can all impact a supply chain quite negatively. But around 44% through Los Angeles Long Beach in 2003, the supply chain is being lengthened and you're coupling it with globalization and it suddenly can create the perfect storm. Recent headlines. So these are some of the um, typical headlines that we've been saying. IMB identifies a rash of false shipments into North Africa. So loads of false thing, false things, loads of tainted products moving all across the world from different supplies. Pirates intensify attacks in new areas with first Somali hijacking reported in Red Sea. Maersk, Alabama captain held by pirates. Peanut Corporation of America suddenly being hit by a series of contaminations. Somali piracy is the worst in the world. Russia sends warship to Somali coast to fight piracy. United Nations adopts new Somalia piracy resolution. As you see a lot of these states fail, you see groups like ISIS as terrorist organization doing heinous things. They also try to control um, the shipping lanes or, and the logistics that comes with both land, sea and air. And oftentimes that creates an additional security issue. So this is the piracy map. And if you look at the piracy map, you'll see that not all is well. All through this place, these are the places where attacks have been attempted and made all through. And think of it, this area, this is China and India. You've got so much stuff traveling either this way or through the Suez Canal. 
sometimes from China you go around and you come back this way through the Panama Canal. All of these places are fraught with deadly chances of piracy and terrorism and that creates huge issues. Now, if you also look at it, you'll find that um, places like Southeast Asia, Indian subcontinent, you've got issues in places like Bangladesh and places in um, Southeast Asia, such as um, Indonesia, Malaysia and Safehouth. And then you're also, you also have issues uh, surrounding places such as the Malacca Straits, where you've got all these um, strict piracy laws being enacted, yet constant um, uh, pillaging is taking place in the process. You've got Malaysia, where um, off Tomin Island and South China Sea, Philippines, Singapore Straits, Vietnam, uh, southern part of China. The list goes on. And if you visit this place called icc-ccs.org, it'll give you all piracy and um, all these different maritime threats to systems. Counterfeiting is the other big issue and counterfeiting makes it very difficult for companies to actually um, carry out business in a competitive manner. Counterfeiting is nothing but creating false labels and false goods that mimic a certain brand of a higher quality, but you're creating cheaper quality material and oftentimes stealing IP, which is intellectual property in the process. So counterfeiting counts for about 5 to 7% of world trade and worth about $600 billion a year. And that's another supply chain threat because it, it suddenly creates um, massive amounts of work trying to know what to quarantine, what's under IP protection, what's not under IP protection and safe health. If you look at counterfeiting seizures, now counterfeiting, while we're talking about counterfeiting, we also should talk about um, the flow of um, illegal materials, whether you're talking about the flow of drugs, or the flow of um, things like um, endangered species or rhino horns or elephant tusks. And if you also look at it, you'll find that uh, these, are the, uh, these markers are for pharmaceuticals. You've got software, you've got audiovisual, you've got clothing, luxury goods and so forth. And you'll find that there are all these interesting bits that are working especially with audiovisual and others and pharmaceuticals and so forth, food and beverage coming out of this area. You've got clothing coming out of um, uh, various different sections, including places like Florida, where a lot of counterfeiting is taking place at any given point of time, which creates supply chain risk and security issues. So why is it important? If you are to think of it, September 11, 2001, the terrorist attack, $2 billion lost per day. Longshoremen strike, 300 to 500 ships backed up, which amounts in hundreds of millions of dollars. Potential loss of attack to major ports is about 20 billion as an estimate. Even about 10 years ago, 2008, estimate was that 12 million containers are coming into US, up to 490 million containers worldwide, and 10 million containers. They're constantly increasing over time as we are relying more and more on globalization and supply chains. So the top European ports are very busy. The top five European ports through which hundreds of thousands of materials pass through and also creates with the new refugee crisis comes the threat of terrorism because you really don't know which refugees are vetted, who's who, 
people oftentimes don't even know and are not even carrying passports. So you really don't know who's what. And it becomes very difficult given the fact that places like Rotterdam and um, Hamburg and Antwerp and Bremen and Valencia, you're talking about places from Holland uh, to Germany to Belgium to Ger and Germany and Spain. All these places, you're carrying about 10 million TUs. TUs stand for 20 equivalent units, which basically is just the size of a cargo container. Hamburg, about 7.088 TUs. Antwerp, about 7.3 million TUs. Bremen, about 4.565 million TUs. Valencia, about 3.65 million TUs. Now, with so much traffic, the chances of pilferage, the chances of terrorism, the chances of human smuggling, they all get amplified over time. Other key ports around the world, especially in Asia, Asia are Singapore with 25.87 million TEUs, Shanghai with 25 million TEUs, Hong Kong with 20.9 million, Shenzhen with 18.5 million and Busan, which is in Korea, about 11.98 million. So if you are to think of it from Rotterdam itself, so once the cargo is loaded, unloaded, you've got more than 900 intermodal barges moving daily to 70 locations, 200 more than 200 rail moves, 220 million people within 600 miles of Rotterdam. So you're talking about something absolutely massive and a small problem can become a serious issue in a very short term. In terms of rail, you've got more than 15% of cargo to Germany going via rail, about 13% of Belgian cargo, 14% of French cargo. And the US rail, on the, on the other hand, you're operating over four major bridges over the Mississippi River. Other issues are things such as there are nearly 9,000 distribution centres in the Netherlands. In 2000, there were 64.4 billion US dollars in logistics and distribution in the Netherlands itself. So what happened was, in order for mm. us to understand what not only has held in the past, but what is likely to hold in the future. We need to understand a little bit of the timeline. So the Safe Port Act was one of the um, essential acts that was created into a number of laws to improve the security of US ports, given the fact that they were very, very vulnerable. So our idea was to create additional requirements for maritime facilities, creation of the transportation worker identification credentials so that people couldn't just move in and out without valid credentials, and establishment of interagency operational centres for port security. So, as we mentioned, CTPAT is very famous, and CTPAT stands for Customs Trade Partnership Against Terrorism. So it's a customs... Trade partnership ship against terrorism. The other one is something called CSI, which stands for Container Security Initiative. Container Security Initiative. And then you've got the SFI, which stands for Secure Freight Initiative. Initiative. So the idea is to create an interagency partnership, make sure that containers are secure and make sure that freight is not only secure, but also the information is taken care of completely. And then, of course, what happened was, so in 2001, CTPAT was created, which was basically a voluntary program 
very much like uh, global entry or something like that where um, if you signed up for it uh, you'd get uh, quicker customs clearance and so forth in 2002 csi was created in 2003 what happened was they started talking about scanning all containers and 2006 the safe port act was created which was required to institute new international supply chain security programs uh, with all foreign trading partners, all international traders and, and the shipping industries. It was meant to be a joint venture across all these different groups. So what happened was SFI came in 2006 and became a pilot program with 100% scanning of containers. So this one requires 100% container scanning. In 2007, there was something called HRI, and which basically required radiation detection to see if somebody was planning on pushing through like a dirty bomb or something like that. That way the radiation would be able to, you'd very much like a Geiger counter, You'd be able to immediately figure out if things are problematic or not. So we are in the zone of 100% scanning right now. <clears throat> so the Safe Port Act is a container security initiative for import assessments and customs trade partnership against terrorism, as we just talked about, which is CTPAT. The container security initiative consists of four core elements. Firstly, in Using intelligence and automated information to identify and target containers that pose a risk for terrorism. Now, how do you ever do that? You start looking at what is the port of origin? What was the source of the materials that are loaded into the cargo container? You therefore start using pre-screening for containers that pose a risk at the port of departure before they arrive at the US ports. The idea is you start figuring out if something's wrong at the port of departure rather than at the port of arrival. And using detection technology such as X-rays to quickly pre-screen container pose a risk, using smarter tamper evident containers so that you knew that know that nobody's been able to break in when it's been transiting through some other port in the world or while it's been on high seas or in the air or on the train, somebody didn't break in and steal different things. Very similar to, I don't know if you watch Breaking Bad, but um, there was an episode where um, they steal an entire railway carriage, I think, and 900 gallons of methylamine. And instead, they fill it with water and um, they replace the tamper-proof setup but that is what you're trying to avoid in the first place. So containers concerns, firstly, you've got cost to X-ray containers, the manpower issues, the more you check, the more you screen, higher security basically means more manpower, more cost, more delays, and greater chances of creating radiation and so forth in case something like that happens. So the transportation work identification credentials, you basically, you're using it for port employees, longshoremen, and unescorted access personnel so that you know that everybody is validated and credentials before they're let into the space. CTPAT was voluntary, as we talked about it, began in November of 2001, Start, has 9,000 members right now, and Canada has a very similar program called FAST, which is free and secure trade. So on the CTPAT, uh, if you, it's, it's completely voluntary, and you can participate on your own right, but you can then play an active role in the war against terrorism. It reduces the number of CBP, which is Customs and Border Protection Inspections, and you also have priority processing for CBP inspections, which basically means they're trying to provide you an incentive for you to sign up and become a bit of a signatory to CTPAT. Uh, 
there are nonetheless issues that still remain. This is a true story from Orlando International Airport where once they audited for supply chain security, they realized that there's no stuffing of doors for employee entrance to baggage claim areas. People can just ent enter and do whatever they want to. Guns could be smuggled into planes by employees. No requirement for us to staff these doors. And OIA, the Orlando International Airport spokesperson said, and TSA said, not my job. They were identified as security issues in 2004. 2006, half of TSA screeners failed the test that measured how well employees could identify explosives, guns, and other weapons on a scanner, but can better identify bottles of mouthwash and toothpaste. Now, if that isn't spooky, I don't know what is. The same thing happens with food security, which is another huge issue. The next level, it, terrorism is not only shipping of people who are terrorists or devices that are that can create um, or that can sort of aid terrorism, but even food. If you look at Peter Pan peanut butter had E. coli poisoning 2007 coming from supply uh, supplies. E. coli from fresh, fresh spinach 2006, Chi Chi's E. coli from green onions 2003, Taco Bell E. coli, and E. coli is a type of, um, um, what do you call it, um, bacteria or virus called Escherichia coli, and this is one of the primary things in um, supply chains especially because these are things that can perish or this can be tainted these things can be tainted and food can be tainted very quickly so taco bell had an e coli attack in 2005 so none of these were terrorist attacks but they impacted supply chains similarly there has a salmonella and e coli scare in 2008 and the salmonella epidemic in 2009 with more than 3,921 different items that had to be recalled in the process. So Terrorism Risk Insurance Act was created uh, by George W. Bush in 2002 to st stimulate business and investment that had slowed to a trickle after the events of September 11, 2001. The law creates a three-year federal program that backs up insurance companies and guarantees terrorist-related claims will be paid. But it's a short-term measure. You don't want to constantly buy insurance. You'd rather like to fix what could be otherwise wrong in your existing ports, airports, transportation hubs, choice of supplies, choice of sourcing, choice of transits. So on December 26, 2007, the President signed into law the Terrorism Risk Insurance Program Reauthorization Act of 2007, which extends the terrorism risk insurance till 2014, extends the temporary federal program that provides for a transparent system of shared public and private compensation for insured losses from acts of terrorism. So, to summarise, there is a direct link between supply chain security and homeland security. Logistics costs are a large part of manufacturing costs and need to be managed very well. Savings in supply chains cost to bottom line. So in order for you to, under, to figure out, you need to figure out your sourcing, you need to figure out your transit, you need to figure out your suppliers, you need to figure out your ports, offloading and unloading. You need education and training. And finally, you need to have security as a philosophy not as a band-aid. See, it's not a quick fix. It has to be a philosophy. Thank you very much, guys.